I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. You can never say that Norman Siegel is part of any establishment, and thank heavens he isn't, <laughs> because for years he's been New York City's civil libertarian fighting for justice and our equality, and welcome. Thank you, Ronnie. And now you're challenging the political establishment. Yep. yep. You've got this judicial inquiry that you have requested, but the court has to rule whether you can con they will continue with this? Right. We've, Explain uh, this. Well, we filed a special proceeding uh, on behalf of eight taxpayers, uh, three from Brooklyn, two from Staten Island, and one from Manhattan, Queens, and the Bronx. So we have people from all over the city, African American, Latino, Caucasian. And uh, we found this provision in the city charter, which was created in 1873 out of the Boss Tweed era because of the financial improprieties. For viewers, Boss Tweed thought that the public money was his <laughs> money. And therefore, uh, <laughs> they put this provision in that allowed for taxpayers to go into the Supreme Court in New York County and ask for what's called a judicial summary inquiry. It allows a judge to then call the various political officials into his or her court, put them under oath, and it allows the attorney to ask them questions. For example, in this situation, the granting of public money to fictitious organizations. So this is based basically on the recent revelations of the council's budgeting. Right. The recent revelations revealed that for the last seven years there were appropriations to fictitious organizations. So who started it? Who continued it? What was the rationale? Who made up the names? This was not an innocent mistake. Someone intentionally, knowingly created this scheme and I think that the taxpayers have a right to know the answers to those questions. So we sued the New York City Council and we sued the Speaker of the Council, Christine Quinn. On May 29th, we'll have a hearing before a judge to find out whether or not our request for this inquiry will be granted. If we do, it'll be an important and serious endeavor. What court is it in? It's in the Supreme Court of New, the State York of New York County and we were randomly assigned a judge and uh, we'll see what she has to say. I think that it's a, on all fours as us lawyers say, uh, this provision I think is brilliantly on target because it says that you don't even have to prove criminal violations, all you have to show is an allegation of a violation or neglect of duty and we argued that creating fictitious organizations at a minimum is a neglect of duty because people should have known that and even if they didn't know it they should have known it but we also allege that there had to be someone or some people who knew this because someone made this up and finally the city charter talks about that the city council people are trustees of the public money so we think that that therefore the way they set this up is a violation of their duty and that's enough to get the inquiry which very good about this provision is that it doesn't require the judge to make a finding of guilt or innocence. It requires a hearing the where the transcript is then recorded and given to the clerk and as you say the facts come out and there could be things that we will learn that are not on the criminal level but should be learn so that we then figure out what meaningful reform so this never never happens again. So the money that went into these categories like an there was something about immigration I think there was one about domestic violence wasn't there? Right. They made the names up. Yeah. And now what ha do we know what happened to the money that went into those groups? We don't know for sure. I would assume that some of the money went to legitimate not-for-profit right. groups but the process was wrong and then the question becomes... We don't even know of, if all the money was spent. We don't know if all the money was spent. And there's recent revelations that some of the money went to organizations where relatives of the council people uh, were employed. So that raises a lot of issues. Is this the first time... Well, you've taken on the mayor a lot. You took on Take Giuliani. On How many times did he, you sue him? Uh, 27 <laughs> times. We won 23 in whole or in part. <laughs> So you've taken on the mayor, but you've never really taken on the council or the state legislature, have you before? No. Yeah. And uh, there were people who were calling because of the media reports yeah. and saying to me, can't we do something about this? And then I remembered that Mark Green, who was the public advocate, did this against Giuliani when Giuliani uh -huh. released 
the juvenile records of Patrick oh, right. Doris I Mott. That. Yeah. And the judge, I read the decision, it was written very well by a woman named Louise Gans. It upheld the constitutionality of this provision and it said that an inquiry was appropriate. And then I read some more and it turned out that you didn't have to be the public advocate. Five or more taxpayers could bring it. So that's what we've done and good. we'll wait and see. That's good. These are very interesting times. They must be especially interesting for you since I think from your early ages you were involved in civil liberties and in racial politics basically. Right. From 42 when you years were young, ago I went you were down south. south, right? I went to Mississippi as a law student in the Law Student Civil Rights Research Council program, got trained in Edwards, Mississippi and then went back and worked for the Southern Regional Office of the ACU based in Atlanta and traveled in the summer of 66, 67. In the summers of 66 and 67, on Sunday mornings, I would go to Ebenezer Baptist Church, mm -hmm. and who was preaching yeah. every once in a while? A guy named Martin Luther <laughs> King, Jr. He was so impressive. Uh, you know, we <laughs> miss him so much. And uh, the movement has never really been the same, but the movement continues and struggles in all different kinds of forms. So and the dream of equality and justice for all is still illusory, in my opinion. But what, if, what about this presidential election and how that's uh, working right now? It's a very complicated thing, isn't it? It is very complicated, but, you know, I'm very optimistic. I never thought in my lifetime that we would have an African-American seriously be considered for president, let alone potentially on the horizon of becoming the president of the United States. I think that's very exciting. I never thought that we would have a serious woman candidate, and now we do, so, and potentially they both be on the same ticket, which would be very exciting from my perspective. I think that the fact that so many young people are energized about electoral politics is exciting in and of itself. So I think 08 has been a very That's exciting great. electoral year, yeah. and it bodes well for the future. It's an interesting thing, too, in the way the vote breaks down, in that younger people, I think, are showing that they have, I think, a different perspective about race. I think that's right. I think that people who are younger, the uh, demographics show, are willing to consider people, as Dr. King talked about, based on their character, not on yeah. the color of their skin, and, and that down, is great. Walk down Broadway and you see more interracial couples of all colors, and that uh, the woman who was the first uh, challenged the law, who just recently died, well, you, you know that? Miss Loving. Yeah. Yeah, to Virginia. It's, People don't know until 1969 you when could, the Supreme you Court, that. right, you could not interracially marry in Virginia, and that's less than four years ago. So the history of America, right, is astonishing, and yet we're incrementally making the progress to undo all the bad stuff in our yeah. history. Yeah, and we certainly have that problem in New York, don't we? I mean, we've recently, we see it more often, I guess, these days in law enforcement. Do we see it and still see it in, you know, for a long time it was in housing, real estate. Is that still occur in, in the city? Unfortunately, yes. Yeah. Uh, my friends in the South always refer to us as up South. And my conclusion is that in the Deep South, it was blatant. To use the pun, it was black and white. Here, it's much more subtle, it's much more sophisticated, but it still goes on. And the fights that we had in the South in the 60s, uh, today you have to be much more creative because the defendants will deny in any way that they have any racial animus or prejudice. Uh, no one's prejudiced. Everybody loves Martin Luther King, especially on Martin Luther King's birthday. But throughout the rest of the year, people are not willing. In retrospect, at least the Southerners were very honest about their prejudice. and. In retrospect, it's easier to confront and overcome when Over. you know what you're dealing with yeah. as opposed to the subtleties and the sophisticated defenses that are thrown at us in the 21st century in places like New York. Yeah. We may have a, um, we have, how would you rate our police department I overall? Think, I think the police department does a good job in a lot of areas but needs enormous improvement when it comes to race relations. For example, uh, a decade ago, uh, Rudy Giuliani, who was a classmate of mine at law school, after the Weimer incident, put me on a task force about police community relations. And I, along with Michael Myers from the Civil Rights Coalition and Margaret Fung from the Asian American Legal Defense Fund, we wrote a dissenting report. We got material that showed that 94 percent, this is 1997, 
of the captains and higher in the police department were Caucasian. We made recommendations about affirmative action, equal employment policies to racially diversify the leadership of the NYPD. A decade later, 2007, it shows that 89% of the captains and higher are Caucasian. And that, in a nutshell, 9 out of 10 of the leadership of the NYPD is Caucasian. They continually engage in denial. Uh, they're unwilling to look in the mirror. Uh, recently, Ray Kelly, who does a pretty good job, but is not good on certain issues, especially on civil liberties issues and right to protest, he said that he thought that community relations were the best ever, maybe winning by default, he meant, but he thought that was so because of the diversity of the police department. Now, they've made some incremental progress on the police officers, but in the higher-ups, it's still overwhelmingly Caucasian, and that's a serious problem. But if they didn't have many people of color in the lower part, it's, it's hard to move up. Well, Will it you get take, better? <laughs> you take tests, uh, and then uh, from above captain, it's discretionary appointments by the police commissioner. And in the decade, uh, in 97, there were 599 positions. In 2007, there were 759 positions of captain or above. And in that situation, he had 160 new opportunities to appoint people of color into those positions. He said he did, he, he said he did but when you look at it, it's like incremental progress. Yeah. It's not sufficient. So I don't think he gets it when it comes to race. And too often, the police department, as well as the mayor, this mayor included, they're always defensive when you raise this issue. I did FOIL requests in 2004 and 2006. I'm doing it again in 2008. Freedom of information requests. Freedom of yeah. information requests for all the city agencies. The higher you go in all the city agencies, they're the Caucasian. Okay. Even in the New York City Human Rights Commission, <laughs> there's an African-American woman who's in the top position, but the next nine position are all Caucasian. And on the lower level, that's where the African-American and Latinos are as a general proposition. Do women do better? Uh, are there more women in the, are there any women in the higher echelons of the police department? There are a few. There's a few. Women, there's a sexism legacy as well as a racism legacy at the NYPD. And again, they're unwilling to admit. And what we've learned historically, that if you don't admit you have a problem, you're never going to overcome it. Doesn't the discussion about sexism versus racism distress you? <laughs> it does, because we should have both. Yeah. We should never be pitting That's gender versus race. Yeah. And it's easy to succumb to that, and we're seeing it now in the Clinton-Obama fight. It is very frustrating, and I always say to people, no, we have to have both. And we can have both, and we must have both. But sometimes people are very narrow in their focus, and some people want it all at once. And I understand an all deliberate speed did not work, but sometimes people, I think, need to kind of recognize that there are other movements that are also as equally important as yours. And too often, even with client groups that I represent, they're only focused on their rights. And not the day that we get the integrated community... Well, that's been a problem, I think, in recent years. That's been the way we've had the advocates. They've been pitted against each other for money, and for, for recognition and for everything. Instead of having, I've never understood whether maybe it's the political party fault that we haven't had an umbrella organization where people do come together and, and have you know multiple gain. I, don't, I just have never been able to figure it out. There have been attempts to bring an umbrella organization yeah. together in New York, similar to what was in the South, and they have not That's succeeded right. as a general rule. And I think it has a lot to do with turf. It has a lot to do with money. It has a lot to do with who's on the 6 o'clock news. They can't put six people, so they want a spokesperson. Yeah. So the blue-haired, left-handed group only wants blue-haired, left-handed people to speak for them. Right. Oh, I, think that's, I, <laughs> I think that's a mistake. I think it's a mistake. Let's not get it out now. And you spend a... more energy and more time arguing about things like that than you do to try to achieve your goals, right? I don't know. Right. The opponents love when we're divided among ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Where did, how did you get to be this kind of a person? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Borough Park. Uh, and what was Borough Park like then? It was a working class area, uh, Jewish, Italian American, very few people of color. Uh, our parents, my parents never finished high school, let alone college. 
but education was a biggie. And then the teachers, PS 131, Pershing, Neutric, they were great. Uh, some of the teachers saw potential in me. They turned me on to reading. Once I start reading, the world was mine. And then I went south, and I went to Mississippi. I remember specifically in June of 66, one night in Mississippi, seeing the stars. You never see the stars in New York unless That's you're right. in the planetarium. And there I was, and I said, you know, everything that Miss Wynn and people taught in history class, it's not true. There is no equality in America for black people. And then I said to myself, talking to myself, <laughs> I said, so what are you going to do about it, Siegel? And I said, I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to make the constitutional system a reality for everyone, especially the powerless. I love it. I keep doing it. And uh, I'm getting to the point where I have to try to turn on the younger generation of lawyers to do the same thing. And uh, it's very fulfilling to take on the powers be and hold them to what the Constitution says of freedom, justice, and equality for all. So you never, ever thought of going to a law firm or trying to make a lot of money? Well, I did work in college at a major law firm, and they were very nice to me. But I saw the structure. I saw how it was all set up, how it was all about money. And I said to myself, I don't think this is for me. And then I went south. And, and was there it. it was. And I, you know, that. And what did your parents say about that? Uh, my dad was afraid for me. Uh, my mom was concerned. Uh, but they were supportive enough and knew it was the right thing. Years later, they were very proud. And when I went, I think they were, oh, does he know what he's doing? Oh, he's just, you know, rebelling and all that stuff. But uh, they were very supportive, uh, and they're no longer around. They died, uh, but uh, they left me some wonderful uh, legacy of being concerned about other people. And you're passing that on. Yep, I've got five grandkids now. and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and you pass it on to the people that you work with. Pass it right. on to the people I so, work with. So um, you're planning to run for public office? Yes, I'm going to try once again for public advocate. Uh, I think it's a job You are that, a stubborn person, right? Well, I don't like to think of myself stubborn. I learned in the South that it's good to be smart, but more important, stamina. You just have to keep going. You don't give up. Right. And I have this dream that someday I will be the public advocate and be the advocate for the public and have even greater impact than I'm currently having. I don't having. mean to be negative or anything when I say you're stubborn. You have decided that this is an office that, that qualifications, you fit those qualifications perfectly. Absolutely. And you really truly believe that you would be able to take that office and help all these people. Is that, we, we that's can, what I meant by stubborn. Right, so you've run help. before and you haven't gotten elected and you're going to run now, right? Right. We've come in two times second. Uh, Betsy Gopound can't run again because she's term limited, and I think that it's my time. And what I mean that is I run, I understand what the electoral process is about better now than ever before, and I have a lot of people who are encouraging me and supporting me, and I think in 09 uh, we could win. <laughs> Well, I certainly admire that tenacity, and I, I mean, I think you've got so much to offer that people may be crazy not to, <laughs> to say, let's get it and see it. If you were a public advocate, how would you have, um, what would your role have been in the Sean Bell um, case that we've been seeing unfold in front of us? I would have been playing a public role in informing and educating people about the process. Uh, the verdict in Sean Bell underscores the need for systemic change when it comes to allegations of police misconduct. Uh, to begin with, uh, from day one, uh, you have to make sure that the people who investigate the scene do it uh, properly uh, and that all the evidence is preserved. There were questions here. There's always questions in the Diallo case yeah. and all of that and, stuff. And, who, and what was the other case out in the um, club in Brooklyn? Not uh, Luima. That was, a, that was a, a very important case where it wasn't reported accurately, right? Yeah. yeah. There's always okay. a pattern of that stuff. Yeah. I, I advocate the creation of a statewide permanent special prosecutor for corruption and brutality. We had one after the Knapp Commission in the early 70s. Nelson Rockefeller, through Executive Order 55, created a special prosecutor for New York City on corruption. Mario Cuomo in 1990 abolished it, which was a mistake. We should expand that so it's corruption and brutality. You need someone who has the expertise, the experience,
who doesn't have a conflict. The local DAs work with the cops on a routine basis, and therefore there's an institutional conflict of interest. Second, there are times that the indictment isn't appropriate. There's times that a conviction is not appropriate. You, if you have someone that people trust, especially the people of color communities who are too often the victim in these situations, then the system can work better. And you'll have more acceptance of a fair verdict. Right, and sometimes in these cases, the DAs over indict. So in Diallo, they went for murder too. Here they go for manslaughter. You're not gonna get those charges because that requires intent. You can't persuasively argue to a jury or a judge that these cops intended to kill Sean Bell or, Abner Louis, uh, or Amadou Diallo. What happens, in my opinion, in the three times that we had successful convictions of an on-duty officer, 1977, 1996, which I was involved in the case, and 2003, it's criminal negligent homicide. Within homicide, the high rung is murder, then there's manslaughter, then there's criminal negligent homicide. If the issue is framed, were these officers negligent? Did they not do the job properly? Then I think people might agree with that, and they should. But if you argue and frame it, did they intend to, to kill, kill him. you won't yeah, you get can't a conviction. Do it. Yeah. So if you don't get a conviction, someone has to explain to the community right. and the affected community the dynamics and the points that I've just made. And someone who has a track record where the community trusts the person. The local DAs are administrators. They're not in the courtroom. They're not doing the cases. And the Bell case, there are lots of issues that, for example, why didn't they go for criminal negligent homicide? Why did they put the testimony of the officers and the grand jury into the record, guaranteeing almost for sure that the defendants would never take the stand? Right. Why didn't they call an expert to explain how they could have handled the situation as opposed to how they did this? So those are just some examples of how I believe the case wasn't handled properly and why people legitimately are angry. So if you change the system, give the cops better pay, Make sure that the Civilian Complaint Review Board that you authored has some extra that you, teeth. That you uh, invented, all right? <laughs> right, but we didn't succeed. No. It's 15 years later, and we still have to improve that. Also, people don't understand that when a cop comes in and gets hired, he gets a psychological test. They don't get any psych tests thereafter. You should have random psychological testing with concern for civil liberties so that it's a very stressful job 10, 15 years later. Very. They should be checked periodically. And finally, the academy. We need to set up the commission to look at the training material. We give people six months to become a cop. It took three years to be a lawyer. Maybe we should expand from six months to a year the training Such at the academy. Yeah. It's an important job. So these are some of the systemic changes. If I was the public advocate, I would be talking about that. I would be recommending systemic change. We would be having hearings, even yesterday's hearing. I was there for a little while. Uh, oh, tell me about that, because, you know, I read the papers today. I didn't see it. Well, well I read the Times. I it, didn't read it. It wasn't there. There was very little coverage because it didn't advance the issue, and it gave the appearance that it was one-sided. This is a congressional hearing. Well, it was a congressional con forum. The Congressman you Conyers had, came to New York to have. Right. But the sense was that this was all about public relations, and it was too, too much bad. beating up on the police department. The police say they weren't invited. Kanye says he did invite Commissioner Kelly. So <clears throat> I think that if you're going to have a forum, you need to have it balanced to hear the different perspectives, because if you only hear one side, then it's not going to have much credibility. And I've been watching the script on these cases for now more than 20 years, and unfortunately it's very similar. And we need systemic change, and we need it now. And the reason why it's possible now is you have in the seven a guy like Eric Adams, who used to be a captain. He's an advocate for change. You have a governor, David Patterson, who got arrested during the Diallo proceedings, so he understands the need for this systemic change. I think if we don't get the systemic change in 2008, we're probably never going to get it. Um, what about just the, the, the practices of the police department, plain clothes people? for instance, has that always been a problem? It's always been a problem, it continues to be a problem. Some of the threshold questions, at least policy-wise, about what happened with Sean Bell, why were they even there? I know. And what kind of operation was going on, and what kind of training did those officers have? So whenever you have plain clothes, sometimes the plain clothes unit has to justify its existence, and sometimes they go over the line, and sometimes That's they're right. not even properly trained. Right.
So um, we're really basically coming to the end. If you were the public advocate, you would be able to introduce some legislation, wouldn't you, in the city council? You can introduce legislation, you could hold public hearings, and you could uh, put together coalitions. I'd have hundreds, hundreds <laughs> of volunteer assistant public advocates, and we would do intake on Wednesday nights and Saturdays throughout the city. People shouldn't have to come to the municipal building to make their grievance. Government should be out in the neighborhoods. It's a huge city with lots of different neighborhoods. You should be present. We could excite people. You remember what you, Jimmy, and I did with other people where you would go week after week where the homeless were out on the street? And then by doing that advocacy, you were able to get 50% of the people in a small group on 59th right, Street near right, the hospital right. off the streets. There's so many things. There are so many talented people in New York who are hungry for the right. opportunity to, to give. Center. And that's what a public advocate should be doing, is setting up opportunities for future generations as well as all New Yorkers to give and make this city better. Well, Norman, if I had to say one thing, it's almost as if you know too much to be elected <laughs> to public office. But I hope that the electorate is getting to be more um, careful and when they elect, because as someone says, it's like hiring a person to fill a job. And um, it sh certainly should be an, a, an electorate that's looking for the future of all of us. Well, I'm optimistic, and, <laughs> and it's always a pleasure to be on your show. I always <laughs> said to people that Ronnie was someone who was a star in the city council, and we miss you, your intelligence, and your compassion. What a way to end my program. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> it's a pleasure, Ronnie. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.